Hi, welcome to the next installment of Art So Journaling. In this lesson, I'm gonna invite you to think about the concept of your spiritual ancestry. And when I use the phrase spiritual ancestry, I'm not referring to any sort of relationship you may have with your faith or the religion that you may practice, nor am I referring to those blood relatives uh, or individuals that we are actually physically related to. What I'm referring to are individuals, whether they be specific role models or heroes, they could even be mythical characters, um, they could be people with no names. They're the ancestors or individuals that inhabited this world prior to us and set examples on a certain basic tenets of humanity. Um, and by examining or uh, looking at the values that you hold deeply to your own sense of personal self or identity, and then thinking about other individuals in the course of time who also shared those same values, you can create a network of connection and intention with the energy and the history of or, or trajectory of your life. So grab your materials, settle on in with your journal, and spend some time with me thinking about your spiritual ancestry as we work together on a page. All right, so let's take a look at the materials we're gonna to use today. First, you're gonna need a journal. Today, I am working in what is called an altered book. This is just a volume, um, a published book, and I've reinforced the binding that was coming apart just with a piece of tape, uh, but, uh, and then I just work, I work directly on the pages. So this is what my, my journal is gonna be today. You are also going to want some sort of um, placemat or a larger piece of paper that you can use as sort of a protector for the pages. I'll be demonstrating how you can use that later. Um, you are going to want either a comb that you can clean, late, clean later or some sort of tool that has a little bit of an edge or pattern to it. This um, knife has some teeth to it. A simple spray bottle. A couple of crayons or uh, watercolor, water-soluble crayons if you have them. I have a few pieces of charcoal in different thicknesses and softnesses. I have a water-soluble pencil, but you can use a regular pencil if you choose, and a mechanical pencil. So the value of choosing these three tools here is that they're all gonna create graphite style lines with different sensibilities. Um, so you wanna choose a variety of tools that are gonna give you similarly, uh, or give you the ability to make line, to create line work but you want it to be different from each tool. Um, I have a paper plate here with some white gesso on it, and I have a little uh, card for distributing that. And I also have um, just a house paint sample, and it's in a color that's very similar to um, the white gesso, as well as the cream of my page. So you don't have to use house paint, you can use any type of paint, but what you want is it to be very close in value to your gesso and also to your page. Okay, let's get started. So I have my journal here, and this is a journal that I work self-portraits into, um, and I've been using it for a number of years. And um, a couple of pointers that I wanted to share is that, number one, a self-portrait doesn't have to actually physically look like you. You can do a symbolic self-portrait. Um, you could also do a variety of approaches to a self-portrait. Um, but, you know, why create a book that is full of self-portraits? Well, I think that that is um, a nice way to track how you are responding or moving through your world. Um, and it, I also feel that when, when you do create a page in a book like this, it's important to date the page. Um, so that you have a means of going back and, and placing where you were at at that particular point in time. Um, you may also know th that um, while these pages are all filled, they may feel like I worked them in a particular order, 
but as you can see, I did not. So there are um, blank pages as well as um, pages with marks on them, but it, it, you, when you start a journal, you do not have to work in any particular sequence of the, you know, with respect to the pages. You can choose a page based on what feels right. You could just open the book and let it fall to where it does. Or if you are working in an altered book like I am today, you can choose a page whose backdrop uh, matches or sort of goes along in style or concept with what you are trying to um, what you're trying to say. So, like, for instance, I want to share this page, and I'm not sure the glare is really helping here. If I tilt it up, so you know, this is a portrait of my hands. And it was inspired by the um, Mona Lisa's hands that were shown in the image over here. So just as a way of connecting myself as a creator to um, another painting by a creator who I admire. So uh, just a little introduction there on the use of a printed book to uh, create your page on. So today I wanna choose a page that's gonna go along with the intention of what I'd like to create. And I really like, I like this page with the legs here and I like this one with the shoes, but I also really like this page. Um, and I'm thinking in, in parallel to this one, which is already created. I think I'm gonna work on, on this page today. So first thing you wanna do is choose the page in the book where you're going to work. And then the next thing you wanna do is you wanna protect the other pages in your book from any overspill of product. And the way that I like to do that is I just have a plastic um, placemat from the dollar store and I slip that in underneath the page that I'm gonna be working on. And I tuck it in nice and tight, as tight as I can get it against the binding here. So this means that when I'm working on this page, I can make gestural marks and not be constrained by the edge of the page and trying to keep paint from going into the rest of the book. And that's kind of an important part because this first um, step to our page is actually gonna be pretty gestural. So what you wanna do is you wanna get your gesso and you wanna get your, um, your water-based paint that you're going to use in conjunction with the gesso, okay? So you wanna have both of those products nearby I'm gonna put one on either side. And I'm gonna start by grabbing my, my card here and I'm gonna dip it in to one of the paints. Now I could have poured this onto another plate too if I wanted to, but I'm just gonna work directly out of the jar. And I'm gonna use this card to just sort of smear, smear the paint onto the page. Now I'm realizing that I should have put a piece of tape here to protect this edge, because that's important to me. And where's my tape? My tape is AWOL. Okay, so I won't be able to do that for you right now, because I can't find my tape. But um, if you want to preserve what's going on the other page, you may want to you may want to put a piece of tape there to um, keep your edge nice and clean. Now I've just scooped up some gesso and I'm gonna scrape the gesso over it. Now I'm, I'm being careful here because I wanna preserve that edge. But I'm gonna blend the gesso into the house paint, which gives us some interesting marbling that's happening. I'm also gonna carry the gesso over here to the edge of the page. So really what we're doing here is we're creating a background for our subsequent marks. And the background becomes interesting in this case because it's partially over some type. There's a little bit of an image here. And what you're also going to learn is that the combination of gesso, which has a little bit of a tooth to it, and the acrylic paint, which does not, paint is a little bit smoother, is gonna give you some really interesting 
surfaces to play with. I'm gonna put a little bit more of this paint here. Now, I also, I don't want to cover my page completely. I want some of this text and other stuff to show through. And using a card gives me the opportunity to really, really do that. Okay. So I'm not gonna overwork it. I'm just gonna leave it like it is. And I'm gonna close up my paint so that this doesn't dry out. And before it dries completely, I'm gonna take this tool and you'll see it has a serrated edge on it. And I'm just gonna drag it through or across the page to give us a little bit more texture or interest. And this is optional. You don't have to do this if you don't want to. Um, and honestly, if you do it and you don't like it, you can always go back with your card and take it out, right? You can just smear the paint back over top of it, and um, and uh, those those marks that you scratched right in there will go away. You could also do something similar with the back end or handle of a paintbrush, or even pick up a pencil tool and draw into the paint, create some line work when um, the paint is still wet. So we're gonna let this dry, and then we'll be back. Okay, so now the spread is dry, and I wanna give you a great tip on how to tell if your page is dry. You wanna gently separate it from whatever isolation product you have used, and you wanna hold the page gently between your two hands. If you feel any sort of coolness to the page, then it is still damp, and you wanna, you wanna give it some more time to dry before you continue to work, okay? Now, before we go any further, I wanna give you a little drawing tip. We are going to be working with the idea of a figure um, or human form. And as such, uh, I, I wanted to share a simple technique or strategy on how to draw the figure. And what I utilize is the clothespin approach. So a clothespin has a head and a body portion, right? And then it also has feet. So, you know, clothespin is simply drawing a circle and then giving it a little rectangular shape that you carry down and then you interrupt that rectangle shape with the top half of a triangle. So, you know, while this looks very much like a clothespin, it is also can be construed as an, a human figure without arms but it's a really simple, basic way to draw the human form. And when we begin to work on our page, I'm gonna ask you to think about the different aspects of the human form and how they relate to the sort of figures that you're trying to draw and adapt this clothespin shape to match the qualities of the beings that you are trying to draw. For example, uh, a, a, a woman may have a clothespin or will have a head and perhaps she will have a little bit wider shoulders and a bigger torso. This torso could be her dress, and then she has legs, all right? And, and if she's a pregnant woman, she may have a stomach. You could also give her some breasts with some simple curls, curves. And then because we're using a soft product, we can just blend all these lines out. And now we have a really wonderful stylized human form here, right? Um, we don't need to put in all the details or have her be anatomically correct. You could just add, you know, a little sort of arm shape with a mitten on the end of it. And now you have, you have a, a human form or a pregnant woman. Um, for me, if my person has a big heart, if my clothespin person has a big heart, I may adapt their body to be larger, to hold that heart, and I may, I'll rub these lines out. I may um, also add some sort of shape here at the heart center to draw focus to that. Um, someone who thinks big thoughts or important thoughts, I'm gonna give them a bigger head. I'm gonna change the proportion of the head to their body. I might give them littler feet. I may not give them feet at all. Um, 
So those would be some of the ways that I would draw shapes and that represent human form. As to faces, faces for me are pretty basic and you can adapt this approach again to match whatever you want, but I wanna demystify or take away the perception that you have to know how to draw human anatomy in order to represent the human form. Um, for me, a face is just, you know, two eyes, like eye slits, and then a little bit of a mark for a nose that's somewhat in between them. And then I'm just gonna put a little broken line for the lips and a shadow for underneath. And right there, that's all you need to designate a face. When that is put inside a shape that is somewhat circular, it automatically, our brain reads it right away as a face. And you can, again, you can blur that out, smudge it, um, and it becomes a very sensual, expressive sort of form or, or face. And simple adaptations to this approach or to this sort of face can allow you to make a face more expressive in certain ways. For instance, if you want it to be angry, those eyes are gonna be tilted downwards towards each other, right? Um, and maybe the nose, let's get the nose in there. Maybe the mouth is a little dot um, to, rec to represent that it's pursed, those lips are pursed. Um, if, if someone is laughing or smiling, you can, you can make that mouth bigger, right? So there is, and, and maybe make the eyes a little bit wider. So now we have, we have a smiling face. And I'm gonna demonstrate more of that to you um, as we begin to work on our page but I, I just wanted you to begin to think about the human form in some really simple, approachable ways so that um, when you start to think about having to draw it in your, pay, in your actual journal page, you're not really, um, you're not intimidated. All right, so now it's time to settle into the concept or the idea behind this page spread. And that idea is a portrait of yourself based on your spiritual ancestry. And when I use the phrase spiritual ancestry, I'm not talking about your connection to a specific faith or structured religion. And I'm not necessarily talking about your family tree either. I'm talking about your connection with spirits or ancestors who've come prior to you, or maybe even have lived parallel to you, but they have, they have set the stage, they, they represent the, the elements, the aspects of your personality, maybe your priorities, the goals that you have in your life, the things that you really reach for or strive to be as a human being. They would be people who have done the same thing and maybe walked even the same sort of path that you're walking as you try to become a truer extension of your honest, authentic self. So when we begin to think about these things, there are certain words that come to mind and the words are gonna be different for each of us. But I want you to spend some time thinking about the aspects of being human that you value the most. And you can start to jot those words down, grab one of your tools, um, your drawing tools, and just start to write them down. There's no um, rhyme or reason to where they have to go on the page, and they don't even necessarily have to be legible. So, um, for instance, some vocabulary that I'm going to use is um, the word love. I think, um, I think love is a really, really powerful world, word. Um, spirituality is another one, so I'm going to put it here. Um, dignity, human dignity is so important. Um, and really, I'm just going to continue to write some words as they come to mind. Um, I feel like if as I articulate the ah, as I articulate this lesson, um, the words kind of are chased away because I lose my train of thought. Um, but I encourage you to just settle into the idea. Um, what 
characteristics, um, personality traits, um, expressions of humanity do you value or do you reach for more deeply in your life? And, and just jot those down on your page, okay? Okay, so you've noticed that I have my words are all different shapes. Some are um, capitalized or my handwriting is different across the page. So I encourage you to utilize some differences in that as well. Um, you could also vary up the um, tool that you use to, to write these words if you wish. And I'm just going to go in with my pinky and I'm just going to smudge some of these out. Um, because for me, it's not important that they remain legible. Um, so much as I know that they're there on the page. And, and I'm going to use another pencil and write some more on here. And I'm going to put a symbol for love and open-heartedness. I'm going to just put that right there. So, you know, again, it's just about getting some marks down uh, over top of the background that you you uh, have painted and really infusing the page with intention for the figures that we're going to draw over top here next. So I encourage you to change change up your tool if you haven't already. And now we're going to go back to the clothespin figure idea. But what I want you to think about are those nameless ancestors that uh, expressed these sorts of things in grand ways. Um, and I, I use the word nameless. Maybe they are certain um, icons or specific, actual specific individuals that physically have a name. Um, but I, wa I want you to draw them and invite them, invite their energy to come into your life as you're doing that. So um, I'm, I'm going to think about um, the idea of being a mother and um, the, the unconditional love that a mother has. And, and I'm thinking about not just a particular mother, but the concept of mothers through history, through, you know, the thousands of years. So I'm going to start, start with a head. You know, there's my clothespin head. And then a mother is going to be very full bodied. So I'm just, you know, I'm really just gonna draw her shape here. I'm just going to carry that line down to the bottom and I'm going to give I'm going to give my mother some breasts and I'm really going to give her a belly here. And then, you know, I can just take my finger and I can smudge these out and I can go back and I can redraw her. And you know, when I redraw something, I don't necessarily retrace the lines that I've already that I already have there, I, I make a little bit of a difference. I like, I like that shittery bit. And you know, for a mother's face, I want it to be peaceful. So her eyes are going to be downcast. There's her nose. Here's her mouth. I'm going to change my tool up. Oops, that charcoal is really soft and and it blends out. And I want her face to just be a little bit more visible than that. So I'm changing up to a pencil that will give me that. I'm going to give her a little bit of a chin. Okay, so now I have my mother drawn here. Um, another thing that was important to me was um, or is the, the concept of free thought. So I'm going to draw a figure in here that represents those people who whose beliefs perhaps were different than society's norms at the time, but they refused to change and they spoke their truth. And so in that regard, um, I feel like my figure is going to have a larger head. So let's put that one right here. 
it's going to hit in proportion. Their head is going to be much larger. And maybe they have a, a skinnier, smaller body, right? And I think it's important that they have a direct gaze here in this instance, because they know what they're doing, right? They're looking at us and they're saying, I'm not ashamed, I'm not ashamed of the fact that I'm different or that I dare to think differently. And I'm also gonna, their thinks could, their thinks, that's great. Their thoughts could change the world, right? They were pretty powerful. So I'm gonna put some sun rays out here coming out of their head to just sort of represent the strength of their convictions. So think about how you could perhaps utilize some sort of personal symbolatry to represent whatever your second figure might be. You can continue to add figures in um, and, and fill your whole page. I know that there, there were crowds of individuals. There were lots of people who worked hard for women's right to vote, who fought for the basic freedoms that we enjoy. In our... So I can represent those crowds of people by just drawing circles for heads, right, and stacking them. And then the ones that are right in front or at the bottom of that stack, those are the ones that get the bodies, right? And now I have just created a crowd of people. Um, the scale isn't important. Nothing in your journal page has to be representational of how the real world is. So I give you permission to play with scale and, and really just um, really just express yourself, put, the, put your ideas down. Um, and you don't necessarily have to do it in one fell swoop either. You could work on this page in multiple settings. If you find that the concept is something that you really wanna sink your teeth into, you could also sit back on uh, or on your facing page, you could do some writing or additional thought about what the concept of spiritual ancestry means to you. I'm gonna put one more, I'm gonna put one more character in here because I really like the idea of threes. Um, I don't know, three is a powerful, if the, the Trinity appears in so many different ways, um, across the board, but um, this this figure is gonna be about, about compassion beyond a mother's love. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put her right here and she's gonna have a big, she's gonna have a big heart. She's gonna have a big heart space here, okay? It's really interesting how these lines show up over top of that area that we broke into or carved into with that knife. Isn't that, doesn't that create an interesting thing on your page? So here we have, we have a, a figure that represents compassion. I didn't even give her a nose, but doesn't matter, it's gonna read as a face. And I'm gonna pick up my mechanical pencil, which is gonna make a skinnier line here. And I'm just thinking about compassion and how it can change things, you know? So as I do that, I'm radiating with different circles. And look at this mother, this woman. She is creating life. And I'm gonna carry a line over to this page too. She's beautiful. And this thinker is also changing things. And look at this crowd. Crowd of people that dared to sacrifice.
So here we have a page that is dense with these characters. Um, and I'm just gonna go in and use my tools and make things a little bit darker in certain places and just really help to make this page have a bit more visual interest. And it's not about coming up with a perfect pattern or design or anything that's pleasing, but it just gives me the opportunity to continue to think about, think about these things, right? And when you do this, you won't try to be, or you won't be narrating the process to anyone in particular. You will just be working on your own page, right? So you'll be able to slide into the meditative quality of it a lot more easily. Now, the next step is to add a little bit of color to the page. And I have a couple of watercolor or water-soluble crayons here. Um, it's not important that you have water-soluble crayons. You could go into this with watercolors if you wished. You could go into this with regular crayons. Um, and again, I want to encourage you to um, not necessarily think about actual color of these figures. Um, you can to a certain extent, and we'll put we'll put some peach color right here. Um, but really, just grab colors that feel good to you that um, that are meaningful. Um, to me, this peach or pink color is hope, and I'm gonna add pink, I'm gonna blend it right into the pink here on her face. And yellow is also a hopeful color, so I may put some yellow here around her heart. I also want some yellow here around my thinkers, my brave thinkers head, because their ideas are so important. And this mother, I'm gonna just give her a little bit of blue and remember when you're working with crayons you can make you know you can vary your pressure and make them darker and lighter and you don't have to stay in the lines either so let's let's carry some of this out oh that's interesting when i colored over the charcoal it sort of took it out didn't it okay so i've added a little bit of color here i'm gonna go in and I'm going to write some words once again. Um, I've lost a lot of the legible text that I put on here to begin with, uh, and, and that's okay. But what I really want to do is settle in to the intention, the awareness that I have um, discovered as I worked on this page and add that with a little bit more text. And one of the things that I've become aware of is how our actions um, our intentions can radiate um, and ripple and so um, make waves, perhaps. And uh, so I'm going to put the word radiate right down here. And I want it to be, I want it to be pretty strong. So I'm just going to put it right here. And I'm going to use it with my dark, I'm going to put it down here with my, my darkest pencil. And I'm just going to use... A memory of a typeface that's similar to what's on the page beneath where I started out with because I have that typewritten text underneath. So I'm going to make a nod to that content or that layer of marks.
So there we go. We have a uh, we have a subtext to the page that's sort of an inspiration or a reminder to me. And then finally, I want to put one other symbol on this page that represents the ancestry aspect of this, that all of these people um, are ancestors of mine in some capacity. And we have this symbol of a um, family tree. And so I'm going to lean into that symbol of the family tree. But what I am going to do is I'm gonna create a tree that branches into these areas. And I'm gonna have that tree growing from my, my uh, mantra right here. So I'm just grabbing a tool and I'm gonna to start to draw a tree trunk here. And then I'm gonna branch off or give it a directional growth towards my mother here. And I'm gonna give it a branch that goes over here, that travels over here to my thinker. And another branch that goes here to my compassion person. I need one over here for this crowd. Now I'm using a charcoal stick and I know that this is gonna smear. Oh, I should probably have a branch that goes to her heart, right? I remember that I had the word free thought over here. So I'm gonna put a branch over to this. So just think about, um, think about the uh, text, the location of the text or the intentions that you put down on your page and throw some branches in those directions. You do not have to follow the true architecture or structure of a tree. All you're doing is building some line work that connects them, that it, it's a vein of sorts that really brings all of these intentions or qualities down into a point that is now connected with uh, a deeper intention, okay? And then the other thing that I wanna do, um, since I have these branches here, is I'm just gonna add some leaves in. Um, and I'm gonna take this crayon, and I'm just gonna add some hash, you know, some simple little hash marks at the end of some of these branches to sort of further identify the tree. You don't have to fill the entire tree up with the hash marks. I'm just choosing to do the end of my branches as another way to identify connections with things, right? And connections with these things that I desire or value in my life that these other people have created or manifested in their own. All right. And now at this point, if you have used any water soluble tools um, in your page, you may wish to spritz it with some water. If you haven't used water soluble tools, you don't need to do this at part of it because nothing will change. But what I do wanna do is I wanna spritz my word here, which I created in um, water soluble graphite. And um, I'm just gonna hit it really gently. And I'm gonna let it run. And you know what? Actually, I think I'm gonna hit up here too. It, it can be really tempting to put a lot of water on your page. It can be very tempting to do that. Um, and it's, it's up to you if you wish to do that. Um, but I'm just gonna caution you because with the, if you did the first layer with the paint and the gesso, um, you've protected the paper or, or created, prevented the paper from soaking the water up as quickly as it might otherwise. So your water is really gonna move and it's gonna sit on the surface for a bit. As you can see, this yellow is sort of traveling down into the tree and it's pooling. Um, so if I, there was a lot of water on my page right now, everything would sort of be pooling and creating a little bit um, more of a murky mess. But I'm gonna let this sit for now and I'm gonna let it dry on its own. I'm not gonna hit it 
with any sort of um, heat gun or blow dryer because that's going to make the water sort of skim across the page and um, really change or alter the direction of the marks. You are welcome to do that if you wish. If, if you find that you've got too much water here, you can also grab a tissue and you can blot some of it up. Um, I see how I'm getting a puddle over here. Um, I think it's interesting how the free thought has traveled down or the powerful um, individual thought has traveled down into my compassion and they're mingling together. Um, I find that symbolically really um, powerful. So I'm just gonna let this sit and dry for now and then we will be back with our final, final touch to this page. Okay, so this page was really taking her time to dry. I hit her with too much water. So I came in with a paper towel or a little tissue um, off camera and I just gently lifted those puddles um, and gave her a little bit more time to dry. So if you are encountering that same problem yourself, that would be one way to solve it. The next step here is that I want you to think of yourself as a tree, or perhaps you are some other plant. But I want you to choose a plant or tree that represents who you are. And I want you to think of yourself as a spiritual ancestor for someone who has yet to be born. And in that capacity then, I'm gonna ask you to do a little bit of research. That research could be a Google search. It could be a walk in your yard. But I want you to do a little bit of research and see what you can find if you have access to the elements, literal elements of that thing, that symbol of that plant or tree that you have chosen for yourself. If you don't have access to the physical um, leaves or whatnot from that plant or tree, you can draw one, you can paint one, you can print a photo out, you can collage it onto your page. Um, but I really wanna encourage you, if you are able, to find physical manifestations of that particular object uh, or plant so that you can include it on your page. Um, I think that it's really important that we are aware of the fact that our journals can contain far more than just traditional art materials. So for me, what I have chosen is a maple tree. Um, and I've chosen a maple tree, you know, I don't even honestly know what a maple tree means and I, I should Google that. Um, but maple trees have always towered over the homes that uh, I have raised my children in. So they're really, really important to me. And I have lots of memories of playing with the helicopters with my children. And since that's an important aspect of my page, I'm gonna embrace that in this final step. So I have a small leaf here that I could um, collage in. And I have a couple of different helicopter um, pieces that I picked up. Now, these are pretty flat. So, you know, um, you can always glue things of substance into your book, but keep in mind that the book is ultimately gonna be closed. So you may have greater success with something like um, maple leaf or helicopters or a leaf in general than let's say an acorn or a seed that um, is dimension more dimensional than these. So I'm just gonna sort of play with these in different locations on the page and see what see what feels see what feels or looks like it's interesting to me. Um, I can keep all three of them. I could cluster them together, have them in separate places. Actually, I think I just like this, this right here. And I just recognize that the word radiate can also um, connect with the way a helicopter travels through the air, one of these seeds. They sort of spin and they also create waves and 
um, ripples in the air themselves. So this is a connection that I've made um, in my head that I think I'd like represented on the page by the location or proximity of the seed to the word itself. And I'm going to glue this down. And I didn't include glue in um, my original um, materials list, but um, that was an oversight on my behalf. So you could use traditional Elmer's glue if you wish. Um, you can use Mod Podge, whatever, whatever um, product you happen to have on hand. I'm going to use a matte medium um, only because the matte medium has a bit more thickness to it. And since this is thicker than a traditional piece of paper, I just want to make sure that the product I use is just really going to reflect that. Boop. So I scooped some of that out with my credit card here, and I'm going to slather some on. Let's see. This is really, this is really a thick now it's going on kind of clear right here, or I mean kind of opaquely. You can see this, it's white, or it appears to be. Um, but when it dries, it's going to be clear. And that'll be, it's particularly apparent, or the opacity of the, of the glue is particularly apparent when I put it over top of this seed. So I want to get a good coat over top of it because I'm putting, you know, something dimensional on my page and I want it to be protected. And now I am going to let this dry and do its thing. So here we are now out in the garden with, with my journal and a few of the elements that inspired it. And uh, I just wanted to remind you to date your page. I got so excited to take this outdoors and spend some time with it that uh, I neglected to date my page, but I am going to return to the studio and do that. So date your page and um, feel free to go back into it as well if there are certain bits of the page that you wish to tease or enhance in different ways. Uh, I just want to remind you that the prompts and suggestions I make are merely starting points. I feel that the most valuable part about an art journaling practice is when you adapt it to meet your own inclinations and um, interests. So please run with this lesson. Make it your own in whatever way you can. And I want to thank you for spending some time with me today and my book and the idea of spiritual ancestors. If you so choose to share your pages online, I would love for you to tag them with Art So Journaling, and I'll have an opportunity to see them. Thanks again for being a part of my journaling experience, and I look forward to sharing a new lesson with you. Be well.